We camped in the van for two nights. One night was spent on the cliffs above Glen Column Kill, and one night in the sand dunes near the airport outside the village of Anagri. Now we had checked into the Cashlon Ore Hotel, and it was good to lie in a cosy bed, with the beloved resting beside me, checking her iPad as I stared at the end of Newsnight on BBC. I'm going to bed, she declared. I'm tired. It's early yet, I said. It's only eleven o'clock. You go back down if you like, she suggested. So down I went and sat by the window in the bar for a short while, looking out at the car park and the camper van in the corner. I had spent five thousand five hundred euros on that little black bus, I thought, and here we are checking into a hotel. But I suppose we needed a rest. Then a short little man with a bald head, carrying a shopping bag, sat down beside me. The waitress came towards us. You're here for the scenery, are you? He said to me. I'm just on holidays, I said. I'm just back from Aaron Moore, he declared. He didn't really care whether I was on holidays or landed from Mars. He just wanted conversation in that way that country people who live alone relish strangers in a public house. There was a party on the island last night, he said, for a girline that would be a daughter of a man I worked with for years in London. She was thirty, so all the young people went into the island and drank far too much, and this morning they were still at it. In the pier bar all lined up young rascals like whippets, and them guzzling drink, and outside around the table in the sunshine all the girls were on the vodka and gin, like new lambs guzzling from the tit of a bottle, and them singing. And when we were getting into the ferry to come back out from the island this morning they were still at it with bottles and cans, and them all lunging this way and that in the top deck of the ferry. What I was asking myself is, what will they do when they get to Burtonport? Will they continue, or will they get into cars and go kill themselves? They're good singers in Donegal, I suggested. Are they agreeable enough, he admitted, but they're wicked bad at the driving. What do you think of Daniel O'Donnell, I wondered. The folds of flesh around his eyes moved like a waking walrus, and eyeballs blue as the sea swung towards me, holding me in a firm, interrogative grip. Then he touched my elbow and confided in me, whispering, Daniel has an uncle was a far better singer. He muttered it under his breath, as if he feared the walls might hear his blasphemy. A car arrived outside at hill high speed, leaving tyre marks at the bend outside the hotel before coming to a halt. God take care of us all, the man muttered, and me looking for a lift to gee door, but sure it's only up the road, a might safer walk. The young man who had just skidded his car into the car park arrived at the door of the lounge, looked about, recognised my companion and sauntered over. "'That's me taxi,' the man said. "'So now, enjoy your drink.' And he hopped up with his bag and went out the door, waddling obediently behind the driver. My walk with the beloved earlier that evening to the sea and the wine and sirloin steak had tired me and I was tempted to go back upstairs to bed but I love the open-hearted conversation in country pubs, how easy it is to blend in and how people will sit and talk to any stranger as if they had known them for years. So I decided to hang on for another solitary drink. When we were young, the beloved and I cycled around Donegal. We loved the beaches. We'd lie on the strand just to hear the waves thunder as the ocean approached. Now I experience that same vulnerability everywhere, because old people don't need the sea to feel powerless. Fragility grows with the years, and something unnameable 
roars at me, even in the fury of rush hour traffic, like an ocean that must be faced eventually. It's not just in Warsaw that I walked. I walked everywhere, at least before the heart attack. In Paris, I used to walk from the 6th arrondissement, where I stayed in the Centre Irlandais, writing a book called Bored in the Snow. I used to walk down the hill into town, past Notre Dame, through Saint-Denis and up to the Sacred Heart. I loved the cool sanctity of Notre Dame, followed by all the doorways in Saint-Denis, where the whores stood trying to catch my eye. I loved the laundromats, full of North African women who would fold their arms and stare at me before I climbed the steps up to the majestic church of the Sacred Heart and listened to nuns in starched white habits singing vespers in the late afternoon. And I walked on Banner Strand, along the cliffs of Moher, and up and down Manhattan, Berlin and Naples, and the lovely towns of South Ulster, Dundalk, Monaghan, Cavan, Enniskillen, Five Mile Town, and Ballyshannon, and all the other little towns in Ireland where I did book readings on tour. I have walked them all. I walked up Schlee of League twice, and Errigal when I was a teenager, and stood at the very summit holding on to the iron railings as I looked across the entire county, and then up Crowpatrick with expensive glasses and back down without them. Ireland is beautiful, and the part of it that I love most is the Atlantic coast, but in all the 2,000 miles of wild Atlantic way there is one spot sweeter for me at that time than all the rest, and that was Glen Column Kill. I had dreamed of living there. I had dreamed of the saint like a guide from heaven. But it all collapsed in a heart attack, and I had to call the auctioneer and ask for my money back and explain the catastrophe. I had to get the doctor to write a note to whom it may concern that I had an acute coronary attack and I sent it to the airline company to get the money back too because the flight had been insured. You see, I had put money down on a house in Glen Column Kill and I had bought an airline ticket to Minsk. I was going to go to an Orthodox convent. They were going to make for me an icon of Column Kill and I would bring it back and I would buy this house and I would live there, in Glen Column Kill. But the heart attack finished everything. And in the end, though we could not afford a house, nonetheless with a camper van we reached the ocean easily and we lay on the edge of the world. The camper van was the alternative. When the plan to get a little house in Glen Column Kill fell through because of the heart attack, 5,000 euros and 500 euros for a camper van seemed a reasonable compromise. We had stood on a cliff above Glen Column Kill 48 hours earlier. The beloved had slept, and I'd got out before dawn and walked a few metres to urinate and to hear the ocean roar. It had been sufficient proof for me that we had been guided to our destination. I would go no more a-roving, a-wandering in the night. I would search no more for meaning, and I would not hunger again for exotic churches in far-off worlds. I was home. I had an icon in the van to prove it, the same icon which I commissioned from the sisters and which their workshop had crafted during the winter and which they brought back to Ireland in March since I could not make the journey to Minsk for Christmas on account of my illness. I imagined Colm Kill, the writer, as a difficult young man who started trouble everywhere 
until he found peace on the island of Iona. I imagined him as a wise middle-aged artist who wrote poems and fathered elaborate masterpieces like the Book of Kells. And I imagined him in old age, a white-haired abbot of orthodox Christianity who fell down dead from heart failure quietly one morning as he said preparatory prayers before the divine liturgies of the day in the main chapel at Iona. In the icon made in the St. Elizabeth convent in Minsk, an old white-haired man sits at his desk with pen and ink, and in his hand is a scroll, and on the scroll are the words of a poem he is composing. That I might see the heavy waves as they sing their music to the Heavenly Father. The words are written in Gaelic, and the words come directly from the pen of the saint. The previous day I too had seen the waves swell and crash against the rocks and the cliffs of Malin Moor, singing to the great Atlantic sky just below where the van was camped, and on the morrow I would step further out of time and into that silence which lies at the heart of all ritual as I joined other pilgrims on the long winding path around the holy stones of Glen Colum Kill. There were still a few people drinking in the bar, although the family groups had gone. It was after midnight, and the barman was tired. He was only a boy. Earlier, Liverpool had won on the big screen, and two married women were discussing the game as they sat on high stools. It was close to closing time, so I knew the barman would not come down to my table. Instead, I went to the bar, ordered a drink, and used the moment as an excuse to sit not far from the women. Unfortunately, I didn't notice a man with an English accent and an overbearing manner at the bar, lecturing the barman on how to make a proper martini. The two women ordered gin, the barman fixed them little measures of gunpowder mixed with tonic and loads of ice in long, slim blue glasses. Those are not the correct glasses, the Englishman declared. You've got to serve gin in a gin glass. The boy behind the bar shrugged. Those are the glasses that come with the gin. The sales rep gives them to us. Oh, well, the sales rep is wrong, isn't he? Well, they make the gin, the boy insisted. And I'm thinking, fair play to you, young fella. You won't be put down. Then the gin company has got it wrong. What gin is it, anyway? And he spelled out the name, Drum Shambo. Where the fuck is Drum Shambo? He asked. I was thinking I must be careful here and keep me mouth shut at all costs. "'Because I'm from Drumshambo,' but I said nothing. "'I said nothing, that is, until he came over to me. "'He had a formidable belly, "'and I felt like telling him that it might be no harm "'to have his heart checked. "'Them big bellies is fierce dangerous, sir,' I says, joking. "'But he didn't hear me. "'What you drinking?' he wanted to know. I'd prefer to stay on my own, sir, I confessed. Rory, give this a drink here, he turned to the ladies. Ladies, he said, what are you drinking? The women were sipping from the long blue glasses. Gin, they replied, daring him to get them another one. But he said, Jesus fucking Christ, because he had noticed they were sucking Mikado biscuits that had been left on the bar counter on someone else's tray. Jesus fucking Christ, girls, what are you doing? Biscuits, one of them said. You can't fucking eat biscuits with gin. It's not fucking right. We can do what we like, one of them said. He examined the pack of biscuits on the counter. Mikado, it said. Mikado, he repeated with derision. 
Do you realise, he declared, that Mikado are the gayest fucking biscuit on the planet? I mean, pardon my French, I've nothing against gay people, live and let live is what I say, but fuck it ladies, you can't be serious. The boy behind the bar turned up the volume of the big screen on the wall. A sports match was playing highlights of the match and showing clips from the press conference afterwards. The manager of Liverpool was on screen talking to the press about the great win they had. And then he started crying and the Englishman was irritated because the intrusion had interrupted his dramatic move on the ladies. Turn that down, he said to the barman. We saw it earlier. It's Liverpool, the barman retorted and turned it slightly louder. The ladies swivelled on their high stools away from the man to watch the interview. Why is he crying? One of the women asked the other. Because he's foreign, the man said. Can't stand that guy, he said. Knows nothing about football. The women had turned their arses to him now, settling into their gin, and I had my head down with the phone stuck almost up my nose so he wouldn't bother me as an alternative source of conversation. But then he came. I couldn't ignore him. He leaned his elbow onto the bar beside me and stared at the side of my head until I paid attention. English people used to be invisible before Brexit. Their accents were melodious in the air, like visiting birds in summertime. They were part of every community in the country, solidly contributing to social life. Visitors from England in summertime were usually viewed as close cultural relations. In fact, many visitors from England were actually Irish people who had been forced to emigrate, picked up English accents and returned home every summer to keep their children conscious of where they came from. In any vibrant country parish, you'd often hear English accents as public me- at public meetings speaking about tidy towns issues or Special Olympics or organising street collections for some charity. They rarely joined drama societies, which I suppose is a particularly native kind of madness, but they loved being part of civic society. In Leitrim they grew vegetables in lonely places. They had lovely voices and enthusiasms for Radio 4 and often displayed moral sensibilities about ecological and economic issues that far outpaced the ethical development of country people driven by self-interest. And all the English people I ever knew have been polite and charming, and I'd crossed the Irish Sea in a canoe just to hear the crisp precision with which they use the English language. But Brexit changed everything. The two women had been in the lounge earlier with their children and partners, and their partners had gone to bed with the children. The Englishman hadn't been observing much, or he wouldn't have tried to chat up two married women whose children and husbands were just upstairs. And he didn't succeed with me either. My nose was in the phone. He tried one more time to raise a conversation. Where are you from? he said, squinting at me me like he had me sussed as a Russian spy. Drum Shambo, I said, with as much dignity and condescension as I could muster. When he was gone, Rory turned off the television, the women turned to me, and we had one last drink for the road, although nobody was going anywhere. That gunpowder stuff is good, one of them remarked. It is, I agreed, as proud as if I had bottled it myself. But what could be better than to lie in a lovely double bed with the beloved in the Cashlanor Hotel on a fine June morning, with a view of the sea from the window? I was no stranger to this coastline. I knew 
its spring tides, its little waves lapping and slapping up against the stone walls on the roadside. Not only did I first find love with a boy in a bunk bed two miles away when I was in the Gaeltacht and still in primary school, but I got my first kiss from a girl on a stone wall in Arranmore two years later when I was in another Gaeltacht summer school. And even after I resigned from the church, it was to the coast of Donegal I went a few years later to heal the wounds that had been opened by my flirtation with priestly life. On that occasion I lived in Branch, a townland overlooking the airport at Carrickfin, and I spent a winter marching up and down the beach and along the sand dunes in the roaring wind. And I would cycle in and out to Anagri, labouring through the wind like someone who had failed, carrying a burden so heavy in my heart that I might as well have had my mother on my back or on the back of the bike. I walked the road that winter as the spray drifted in ghostly clouds across the walls and pelted the windows of the hotel and the gable of the chapel and the headstones in the nearby graveyard. And now my lovely black fan was there at the edge of the car park, at the rim of the ocean. I could have sat there all morning, thinking about the past, and Donegal, and the future, the next few hours, and what special wonders might be waiting for us as we made our pilgrimage through Glencolum Kill and I sat admiring the van, its lovely alloy wheels, and its smart black snout, and the shining engine grille with the iconic Mercedes Logan logo that Frank Healy recently replaced. Now that the van was an icon. But the icon of Column Kill made in Minsk was sitting in a box, and the box was in a rucksack, and the rucksack was hanging on a hook in the little wardrobe inside the van. I beheld the van as if it were a tabernacle, but I couldn't dally there all morning. Our booking included breakfast, and the dining room would soon be closed, so I needed to shower, brush my teeth, put on some clothes and head down for scrambled eggs and smoked salmon. The beloved was already in the shower. At another table in the dining room, the pilot was finishing his coffee, the sleeves of his white pilot's shirt rolled up, while two cabin crew in green Aer Lingus uniforms buttered their last fingers of toast. An American woman was making a fuss about the plate on which her poached eggs arrived. Apparently, the plate was cold. I ordered poached eggs too, with salmon smoked salmon, and the beloved just had eggs. I didn't think I would like smoked salmon. Its cold texture wasn't something I would have ordered heretofore, but I was trying to eat more heart-friendly foods. I noticed people at other tables using slices of lemon on their fish, so I called for a little lemon and squeezed it over the salmon, and to my astonishment it tasted delicious. I dipped the salmon in the eggs too, and they were much improved and livelier to taste from contact with the bitter fish. In the hotel foyer, two Americans were getting advice from the woman at reception as I passed. The receptionist was suggesting routes they might take along the wild Atlantic way, restaurants that they might enjoy, places associated with Daniel O'Donnell, the airport, Packy Bonner, Ireland's mythic goalkeeper. Then one of them asked why the hotel was called in Cashlon Or. What did it mean? The receptionist explained how it was the title of a book by a famous writer from the area called Shemus Macrina. Now I knew all that, and I knew too that it was Shosu the brother 
whose bleak life haunted me. The beloved was still upstairs, checking something about the painter Derek Hill on her iPad, and check-out wasn't until noon. I'm just looking at where Derek Hill's house is, she'd say. It would be lovely to drop in there before we head to Glen Colum Kill. So I said, sure, that'd be fine, because I wanted to wander across the road and stretch my legs. I remember myself that, unlike Colum Kill, Shansu Magrina didn't talk to the sea or find equanimity as life went on. He was lost for decades in a Dublin bedsit with stale milk bottles on the window ledge, blue moulding bread on a shelf and unwashed clothes in heaps behind the door. He had a mountain of books jumbled up on one single bed and a second single bed where he slept. Those grim little rooms were not unusual during the thirties or forties in Dublin City, where men endured solitude with no consolations of faith like a monk, but only the gritty truths of mid-century Europe, oppressed by authoritarian churches on the one hand and the sense that secular life was a hopeless abyss on the other hand. I blessed myself with holy water and went inside the church beside the graveyard. I felt nothing. Then I blessed myself again on the way out. There were many white stones in the graveyard, and the surname Macriana appeared on many of them. But in the end I could not find his resting place, although I could hear him whispering, Take me with you. No way, I said. This journey is for me and the beloved. I'm not hanging around with hermits or reclusive writers any longer. It's over. It was over for me too, he whispered back. There came a day in 1935 when I knew the well was dry. I would write no more. I couldn't give a damn by then. Yes, I said, I know all that. You stopped writing because you sank into despair. Then my wife died. I know, and my son, all in the one year. It was unbearable. And you were alone with writer's block, unable to put pen to paper. It must have been a torment. So take me with you. No, you wouldn't suit Glen Columkill, I said. Columkill was a writer too, the shadow said. Which was true. He was a poet, I said to the shadow, but he turned his back on the world for the sake of love. You turned your back on it because you were ill. There is a difference. The shadow was gone. And I felt lonely, as they say in Irish, Hanig Wignes Orum. Wignes, a hauntingly beautiful word that comes from Wig, the grave. That's what I believe. I said it to an etymologist in the Gaelic language one time, and he said, no, 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 it doesn't come from Wig at all. It comes from something totally different. But for me, every time I say the word Weakness. Every time I say the weakness or um, I am lonely. Lonely in a way that the grave makes you lonely. I remember asking the cardiologist at the end of my final checkup how exactly did I get a heart attack? After all is said and done, I exercised and I wasn't terribly overweight and I didn't drink to wild excess. He looked at me and smiled and said, We do grow old. Is there anything in particular I should do? I wondered. Yes, he replied. Enjoy life. It's later than you think.